welcome to worship. Uh, we're going to begin with some gathering songs. Our theme this morning is the spirit in me. So we're going to start with the spirit in me greets the spirit in you. <clears throat> Spirit in me greets the spirit in you. Hallelujah. God's in us and we're in God. Hallelujah. The spirit in me greets the spirit in you. Hallelujah. God's in us and we're Spirit in me greets the Spirit in you. Alleluia. God's in us and we're in God. Alleluia. The Spirit in me greets the Spirit in you. Alleluia. God's in us and we're in God. time. The Spirit in me greets the Spirit in you. Alleluia. God's in us and we're in God. Alleluia. And our psalm this morning, which we'll be reading in a little bit, is a psalm of praise that talks about God's mightiness, and so we're going to sing a song of praise forever. One, two, three, four. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he's above all things, his love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, his love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever. God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever, and by the grace of God we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us forever. God is faithful. 
Amen. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Zoom worship at El Sobrante United Methodist Church. The spirit in me greets the spirit in you. And if you are new to our church or want to find a way to get more connected, I invite you to write in the chat or comment to let us know that you are here. You can sign up for our email list by going to our website. I am Reverend Emily Pickens Jones, and it is good to be back worshiping with you this Sunday. Uh, even though we've had to move back over Zoom. And if you didn't see the email that was sent out, we've had to move our worship online this week due to potential COVID exposure to several of our worship leaders, including yours truly. Uh, I am also sick, not with COVID, according to four tests I took. Uh, but if I get a bit croaky today, just watch out for any signs that I am turning into a toad. Other than that, I think we'll be okay. And I am grateful that we can still be online together, and I hope you are too. Our theme for this Easter season has been resurrection and restoration. And today is the last day of that series. We've come a long way since that first Easter Sunday, and we've been looking into how to live into community through music, healing, trust building, nurturing, and nourishment. And so today we look at a culmination of these things. How do we best live into an Easter people as community? Through recognizing the image of God in each one of us, the spirit in me and the spirit in you, we see this shown through the love of Jesus Christ. So let us give thanks that we are here seeing the spirit in one another in our little boxes and let us worship together. And I'd like to invite our leader, just Marilyn Lamolino, to lead us in our call to worship. You won't see her because she's also helping in the sanctuary today, but we will enjoy hearing what she has to share with us. Take it away, Marilyn. Will you please join me in the call to worship? Jesus prayed for his disciples, giving them into God's eternal care. Jesus prays for us, giving us into God's care. Know that you have been blessed with the love of the Savior. We live in that love and seek to serve God. Open your hearts and spirits now to hear God's word. May our lives be open to God's spirit and reflect God's love. Amen. Amen. In the spirit of uh, in the spirit of the spirit, our opening hymn is welcome, which talks about the fact that all are welcome in this place. And right now this place is virtual because some of us are here in the sanctuary and some of you are in your respective homes. So some of you may be watching this and it's not even Sunday. So wherever you may be, know that you are welcome in this place. Let's walk together for a while and ask where we begin to build a world where love can grow and hope can enter in to be the hands of healing and to plant the seeds of peace Oh 
And uh, we have some technical difficulties, our camera's upside down. So I think um, they're trying to figure that out uh, on, on site. But in the meantime, we can all share with each other a sign of peace. And since we're doing spirit today, I thought I would share the one of my favorite ASL uh, words in uh, to share with spirit. And so for spirit, you take one hand, make a fist, and then you kind of take the other hand, like take your three fingers and like you're pinching something or actually your whole hand, really pinching something and you pull out of your other hand and go like this. So it's like spirit, like the spirit flies, flows through all of us. I think it's a wonderful symbol. So again, make a fist, like you're pinching the spirit and letting it fly free. So I say to you now, let the peace May the peace of the risen Christ be with you. And I'm assuming all of you are saying and also with you since I'm not able to hear. We're going to stop sharing the screen so you can see everybody. Make sure you turn on your camera if you would like to be seen so we can see your beautiful faces. But we are recording, so if you'd prefer to stay uh, hidden today, that's perfectly fine too. All right. Let me remove the spotlight. And we can see one another. Make sure you're in gallery view. All right, here we go. Peace be with you all. It's nice to see you all, especially I don't get to see everybody on Zoom every Sunday. So it's nice to see you. <laughs> Looks like we've got our camera set up again. Thank goodness. So we'll get going with our Psalm reading. She's coming. Multitasker, music maker, pastor, extraordinary Reverend Eileen Johnson, ladies and gentlemen. Take it away, Marilyn. It starts with, oh, our Psalm is Psalm 97, the Lord reigns. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Let them resound loud as the rolling sea. Let every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Let them resound loud as the rolling sea. The Lord reigns. 
rains, let the earth rejoice, let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and, and thick darkness surround the Lord. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. Fire goes before the Lord and burns up his adversaries round about. The Lord's, Lord's lightnings illumine the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens, the heavens proclaim God's righteousness, and, and all the peoples behold God's glory. And every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Let them resound loud as the rolling sea. All worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boast in worthless idols. All gods bow down before the Lord. Zion, Zion hears and, and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because, because of your judgments, judgments O God. God. For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. The, the Lord, Lord loves, loves those who hate evil, evil preserves the lives of his faithful, and, and delivers, delivers them from, from the hand of the wicked. Light dawns for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice, Rejoice in the Lord, Lord O you righteous, and, and give thanks to God's holy name. Rejoice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Let them resound loud as the roar. For our middle song or our anthem special music slot, we're going to be singing Christ Has Broken Down the Wall. This is a song that talks about our unity in Christ and the fact that we all are accepted as we are. And I invite you to pray and meditate on these words as we sing. One, two, three, four. Christ has broken down the wall. Christ has broken. your doubts and fears cast aside your doubts and fears peace and love freely offered here cast aside your doubts and fears we will tear down the walls. We will tear down the wall. God has called us to and all Christ has. 
The second scripture today is found in the book of John, chapter 17, verses 20 to 26. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved me them, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be, be with me when, where I am, to see my glory, which you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make them known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our hymn of response is a beautiful text by Charles Wesley that I don't think we sing that often. And so I invite you to, to sing this hymn of prayer to Jesus. Uh, heads up, when we get to the fifth stanza, we have a five-syllable word, which is a little unusual, inseparably, inseparably joined, which I think also is a wonderful image, that we are joined and cannot be separated. in thee receive 
This is the bond of perfectness, thy spotless charity. And now is the time I'd like to invite those who are young or young at heart to come a little bit closer to the screen because this time is just for you. And we always want to have a time where we let you know how special you are to our church, to our church family, our church community. You are amazing. You are special. You're the only one. So we're, we are so glad that you're here worshiping with us. And I don't know if you've ever seen these before. Uh, maybe some of you big kids, adults, <laughs> have seen them probably. These are called matryoshka uh, or Russian stacking dolls, nesting dolls. It has several names. It comes from Russia and it's made of wood, usually painted by hand. And these beautiful dolls have been popular in Russia for hundreds of years. They have become a symbol of the finest Russian art and craftsmanship and are collected by people all over the world. And when you look at the Matryoshka, how many dolls do you see? Just one, right? You see one right now, but look what happens when you open up the doll. There's a bunch of other dolls inside. Wow. So these dolls can have up to 30 dolls inside of each other. Isn't that crazy? but there's still only one matryoshka. It's not a multiple. Uh, I don't know what the, the plural is for matryoshka. So we'll just call them the plural of matryoshka. And I think that this doll can help us to understand a prayer that Jesus prayed for his followers that we heard in our scripture today. He said for on the night he was betrayed, Jesus prayed for all those who would put their trust in him. In his prayer, Jesus said, Father, I pray that they may all be one as you and I are one. Just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. Jesus wanted all of his followers, so countless of us. I think it would be a pretty big doll to, so we could all fit inside of it, huh? But we are all one. Just as the different dolls are nested inside each other to make one matryoshka, we trust in Jesus, and we must become one in Jesus to make up the church. That's why I say you are so special, and you are part of a community. We may be different in the way that we look or who we love and what language we speak. We may have different customs and traditions, but if we have put our trust in Jesus, he wants us to be one in him, just as he is one with God. We must put aside all of our differences and be united in him so that the world might know his love. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, may we be united in our love for one another, just as we are united in our love for you. Amen. Thanks for being at church today. We are in such an interesting time in the church calendar. Well, okay, maybe scratch that. Maybe church nerds like me find it interesting, but let me share with you why. We have been looking at the Gospel of John this Easter season, and now we've reached what is known in our business as the farewell discourse. Uh, the farewell discourse is what Jesus has to say between the Last Supper and the crucifixion. Wait a minute. Why are we talking about this during the Easter season after the resurrection? And I like to think of it as a summary of Jesus' teachings that we're supposed to take with us in the resurrection. We used to say hindsight was 2020, right? Uh, now I think I'd prefer maybe 2022 or 2023 so we can escape out of that year, but that's beside the point, obviously. Uh, but now that we've experienced the resurrection, maybe what Jesus said during Holy Week is something that we need to pay attention to. 
breaking it down, he essentially says, hey, everybody, please remember these things because I'm going to be gone soon. So you have to remember them. I can't remind you over and over again. And the disciples grumble, look confused, what they do best, right? Uh, They're not understanding what Jesus is even talking about. But we do, you and I, because perhaps hindsight is 2022. It's what we're living in right now. It's clarity about what the past teaches us. What is Jesus teaching in this text? Like I said, we're in an interesting time. Sometimes we teach that today is Ascension Sunday, uh, the time when Jesus ascends into heaven after the resurrection. Today, to honor that ritual, we are looking at this farewell prayer, his last words, a prayer for his followers, not just the disciples, but us too. Jesus ascends this week. The next week, the Holy Spirit descends for Pentecost. So now we just have to figure out what to do with it. And really, the message is just so perfect for our worship series about living in community. Please note that in this text, Jesus prays for his disciples and what they do have ahead of them, literally. But he is absolutely also praying for us, his future disciples. And the focus of his prayer for us in this section is a prayer that all of his followers will be united. I wonder if Jesus prays this prayer because he realized that his disciples were not united, right? Uh, Sometimes we say that a crisis brings community together, which may be true, but we also know that crisis can tear apart. It brings pressure upon the community, a pressure that the community is unable to hold together. And what happens then? Fragmentation. And throughout the Gospels, the writers have been quite candid in portraying all of these petty squabbles between the disciples and followers of Jesus, as well as the jealousy and the division among them. Surely here at this final meal, there were divisions among them. We know that for a fact, right? Uh, But they didn't know that at the time. They didn't know about Judas's betrayal, Peter's denial, or Thomas's doubt. I don't have to tell you that unity is hard to come by. We've seen it time and time again. Unity sometimes feels impossible, or maybe always feels impossible. Has our country ever been less united? It is awkward that we're called the United States, isn't it? Because I realize that dare I say it, our country has never been united. American history is a history of factions and divisions, including a murderous war amongst ourselves, right? Hardly civil, if you ask me. And the church really hasn't done much better, have we? I hear people say, I can't believe that the United Methodist Church is so divided. Really? How do you think we got to the United Methodist Church in the first place? I mean, we've got the whole Reformation, Protestant Reformation, right? That was like a pretty big split. We've got different denominations. Uh, We've got the separation of the Methodist Church from the Church of England. Keep in mind that John Wesley was a Anglican minister, right? He wasn't a Methodist minister, but now that's how we refer to him now. And then we also, the Methodist tradition was deeply divided over the enslavement of people. I'm not leaving the United Methodist Church, I've heard people say. My church left me. At least half of Paul's letters are addressed to divided churches. Would Paul have talked so much about love and unity if his churches were actually of one heart and mind? Separation and division have been with us forever. But just as long as humans have had divisions, we've also had Jesus' earnest prayer that we are to be united. Jesus does not say in his prayer, I know there are perfectly good reasons for there being, for there being divisions and factions among you. This is only human nature. Rather, Jesus prays that all his followers should be one. He makes no distinction between his deeply faithful followers He makes no distinction between people. He says all, he says one. And as we listen in his prayer, 
we know that he is beseeching his father for all of us. He prays for those who will believe in me. Immediately, I have a million questions. I don't know about you. Do we all have to get along no matter what, right? Um, are there any times when there are higher values than unity, uh, ecumenical unity, which means uh, within the same religious tradition? Um, aren't there times when a church leader has to risk causing division and disunity in order to preach God's truth and righteousness, to preach good news? Then there are some people who just really don't seem able because of their personalities, religious backgrounds, whatever, those who seem incapable of ever becoming a part of a cohesive group. Maybe they've just always been that kind of person that never wanted to do what everybody else was doing, right? And these are all appropriate questions if you have them too, not just me. But we should have questions, right? That's what we talk about. But we, should, we do well to remind ourselves that they do not seem to be questions of great concern to Jesus as he straightforwardly, passionately prays for the unity of all of his followers. Jesus is in, in denial of people's division. He's saying it's time to get over it. <laughs> well, that's tough for us to wrestle with, isn't it? In listening in on Jesus' prayer, we hear that our unity, our oneness, is to be a witness to the world of God's love for us in Jesus Christ. There is no oneness and unity without love. If you have ever been part of a family or a marriage, if you've ever been a member of the church, you know that within the bonds of love, there can be much disagreement and contention. In fact, some of our most serious arguments can be signs that we, deep, that we indeed do deeply love one another. If we didn't care about one another, why would we take the trouble to stay and fight? Perhaps in his prayer, and all of his followers might be one, Jesus is giving us instruction in how to fight with one another and in the church. We can have strong disagreements when and only when our dissension is framed by our strong determination to obey Jesus and love one another. You hear that? Everybody hear it? We can have strong disagreements when and only when our dissension is framed by our strong determination to obey Jesus and love one another. In every conflict you enter into, approach it in love and for that unity within what Jesus teaches us. That's why in Bible study, we are learning about how conflict and can impact us and how we don't have to be afraid of it, that it can actually be a good thing. We want to learn the tools that help us be in love with one another, no matter what. The unity that Jesus prays for is akin to that deep communicative unity within the heart of the Trinity, right? God, Son, Holy Spirit. They are three and one and one and three. Uh, I sometimes joke that the only math pastors can do is one plus one plus one equals one because of who God is in God's complete Trinitarian unity, union, communion and oneness. This is built into everything that we do. When we work for unity of the church, we are not attempting to achieve some impossible goal. We are moving with the grain of the universe, the very core of our existence. God's good creation, what God created, also known as shalom. Shalom is not just peace. It means God's intention for the universe, God's right creation. So knowing that Jesus is one with the Father and knowing that Jesus prays just before he goes to his cross for the unity of all his followers, how should we live? I pray that they will be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I pray that they also will be in us so that the world will believe that you have sent, uh, sent me. <coughs> Excuse me. Where does that leave us, friends? Where does that leave us? Especially when we are wrestling heavily with gun violence in our country. We're all deeply mourning and are angered by the number of mass shootings. No other country in the world has the same problem we do. I saw a video this week of someone who collects guns and is 
really passionate about his collection and loves learning about them. And he said that he would gladly give it all up if it saved lives. That, my friends, is shalom. That is putting aside our own distractions for the sake of unity. Now, I understand that guns will not be banned in my lifetime, and I respect people's rights and know that not all guns are used with the intention of harming people. I personally did not grow up in gun culture, like I know some of you might have. And so knowing this, I'm still searching for shalom. How do we build shalom? How do we find this unity for the sake of God's good creation? Jesus leads his followers with this one final prayer before he goes to the cross. In this last prayer, Jesus clearly takes his disciples to the heart of the gospel. This is one last word that Jesus speaks directly to God. And what does Jesus pray for? He doesn't pray that his followers will not be led into temptation or that we will always have smooth sailing in our discipleship or that we will be successful in spreading the gospel. He prays that we will be united. I pray that, that they by will be done, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I pray that they also will be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. It's a little hard to follow the sentence structure of that, isn't it? It sort of feels like I know that you know that you know that I know, right? It's the sense of we need to remember this relationship. Jesus' earnest prayer for unity among his disciples is a particular challenge in our present day and age, in my opinion. Uh, Gil Rendell, author of Quietly Courageous, um, says that most of us who lead the church today grow up in a convergent culture, whereas we now find ourselves leading in a divergent culture. What does that mean? A convergent culture is characterized by commonality, a sense of unity, common purpose, shared values. A divergent culture craves variety and diversity and stresses generational, racial, and gender differences. Whereas a convergent culture urges individuals to hide their differences or to try to fold their differences into the larger group, a divergent culture encourages people to lead with their differences and to cultivate and express the ways that deviate from cultural norms. Neither one of these things is bad or good. It's just simply how things are. Mainline churches like ours, the United Methodist Church, thrive in a convergent culture. As the author says, it isn't difficult to lead people in the direction they're already going, right? The questions and the answers are the same for everybody. We dream the same dream. Everybody wants to look average. Congregational unity wasn't much of a challenge when we could rely upon an already well-formed common identity and purpose. Rather than creating and inculcating a common distinctive sense of mission, church leaders could rely on people's desires to fit into the larger group. At some point, people stop saying, we're here because my family has always been Baptist, which is convergent, and started asking, what can your church do for us, divergent? Does that make sense? Are you seeing that difference there? Another example, Divergent leadership is complex because our organizations and institutions have become multifaceted. And so sometimes that can seem fragmented. So questions like where is the nearest Presbyterian church is convergent. And that has become, why do you want to go to a Presbyterian church, which is divergent? All this means that it's a challenging time to hear Jesus pray for us. I pray they will be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I pray that they also will be in us so that the world will believe that you've sent me. Note that Jesus prays that his followers will be unified so that the world will believe that you sent me. Let's be honest, people. Our disunity is an impediment to our evangelistic efforts to witness to Christ. The world looks at us and says, if Jesus is about love for one another, how come there are dozens of different Christian denominations and thousands of bitterly divided Christian congregations? Gil Rendell thinks the major change from a convergent to a divergent culture is that our societies move from communal to individual, 
right? So I would say even with gun culture, it's a similar sort of thing, communal culture versus individual culture. Divergent institutions tend to be a conglomeration of individuals. But in a divergent age, advertising and technology encourage us to fulfill our individual needs by exercising our individual preferences. We find ourselves living in the equivalent of gated communities in which personal preferences tend to outweigh the sense of common purpose. The subjective feelings of individuals along with the fulfillment of individual desires preoccupy a divergent culture. Political divisions, racial animosity, economic disparities, theological differences, the hope that a group of people like us could come together in worship and service of the Lord without splitting up and eventually breaking fellowship with one another seems impossible, right? We feel heavy because of it. It seems crazy to think that this church or any other could be otherwise than divided except for this one truth. Jesus prays for us. Jesus, God's own son, savior of the world, prays for us to God. And when he prays, what does he pray for? I pray they will be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I pray that they also will be in us, that the world will believe that you sent me. Every time we have an argument in our congregation, whether there's a disagreement among us, any time we seriously consider all the assorted reasons why it's hard for us to be united, maybe we should just give up, right? Maybe we should just stop going to church. It's because it's too much hassle. No. Let's all remember, remember instead what we overheard this day when we listened in on Jesus' prayer and take heart that God has sent this church you, me, this church, all the people we need to obey God's call. The world puts before us a wide range of needs and people are hurting in so many ways. And so the one spirit gives us gifts and then sends us loose in the world. We've talked about this a lot, right? Spiritual gifts, an important part of community. And so let's encourage one another to use these specific gifts that God has given us to help others. Let's honor the diversity of gifts and not put down anybody's gift just because it's not the gift that God has given to you. I'm going to pray this one more time in closing. I pray they will be one father just as you are in me and I am in you. I pray that they also will be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. May it be so. Continuing in that spirit of prayer, I invite you to join in singing Shepherd Me, O God. Shepherd me.
I invite you now to think of those prayers that you have that you're carrying. Bring them to this time where we share with one another, where we share the prayers of our world. And today, since we're on Zoom again, you're invited to stick around for following worship. We'll have a time where you can share these prayers, but we're not recording, so stick around for our time of fellowship. But let us pray now together. Loving God, we thank and praise you for the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Your Son, our Passover Lamb, has taken away the sin of the world. Forgive us and all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear. hear our prayer. Your son said, peace be with you. Bring your peace to the world and to our own country. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Your son appeared to Mary Magdalene when she was weeping. Comfort those who are sad, lonely, or grieving. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your son met the woman and asked them to tell the disciples about his resurrection. Guide Christians everywhere to witness the resurrection in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Your son proclaimed himself to the two disciples from the scriptures and made himself known to them in the breaking of the bread. Reveal him to us and all people through the teaching of your word and the celebration of your holy meal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your son strengthened the faith of Thomas by telling him to touch his hands and sides, reassure those who are troubled by doubts, and strengthen their faith in your goodness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your son conquered death by his death and won the victory by his resurrection. Be with those who are dying and lead them to life with you forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, grant that all who now celebrate these joyful holy days here on earth may finally praise you forever. With all the angels and saints in heaven, we ask this through your risen son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We especially lift up prayers this Memorial Day for those who have given their lives to serve and protect all of us. We lift up the people of Ukraine and peace among nations. For those who were killed during a stampede at a church event in Nigeria. And we lift up all other things that are on our hearts this day. And I'd like to share with you as uh, our, our closing prayer here, uh, a prayer, a rage prayer is what it's called from Reverend Elizabeth Riley. And she wrote this in honor of the, uh, the shootings this week and how to respond as people of faith. Let us pray. God of peace, once again, we find ourselves in the shadow of gun violence praying to you. Our bodies, minds, and spirits are filled with rage and anguish. Your beloved children, our beloved children, have been victims of violence that cannot be undone. And we pray for their comfort and rest in your endless love. Be with those who weep most deeply this night, the parents and loved ones of those whose lives were stolen on that day. May their grief be met with your tenderness and your presence. May none grieve alone. Be with all of us as we bear alongside those families, this unbearable pain. As you witness the death of your son, so too do we witness these deaths. And we despair at the unceasing violence and hate that courses throughout our world. May our lament and anguish that feels uncontainable burn into something new. 
a spirit of justice and peace that does not settle for the world as it is, but envisions the kingdom of God as you have promised, as you've equipped us here and now to make real. Let our tears plant deep the seeds of this kingdom of peace and justice where we create for us and all your children. The world of peace as you have promised and as we are called to build. May we remember that one who was and is and is to come and know the hope of that coming, even in the despair of this moment. In your loving name, Mother, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. And in that unity as Christians, we say a prayer. All of us say a prayer, maybe different words, maybe uh, different arrangements, maybe different languages. We all pray this prayer together. Will you please pray with me? Our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Part of our prayer time, part of our worship time, is also a time where we recognize the gifts that I was talking about earlier, the gifts where we celebrate our unity, where everyone has something to give. And a way that so many of us give is through financial means. And this is something that helps uh, build our church, extend our church, pour out the good news to all those around us. And we give thanks for so many of these gifts that you have given, no matter how big or small. And we invite you, we've, we've been doing a lot more um, over the past couple months as we've reopened and we'll, we'll be back hopefully in person fully next week. Um, and we have a lot that we're doing. And so we invite you to give freely if you're able to give a little bit extra this month uh, to help out with all of the work that our church is doing. Let us sing the doxology together to celebrate these gifts. you please join me in the offertory prayer. God of grace and glory, in the gift of the risen Christ, you long for us to be one in him, unafraid and bold to make your love known, not just in our words, but also in our living. As we bring our gifts to your altar to be dedicated we bring our lives as well to be dedicated for a ministry that brings unity to the body and compassion and justice to all your children. Give us patience to listen where there is division and vision to see the things that unite us. We pray this in love and in the name of Jesus who came that night that we may be as one. Amen. You've heard Reverend Emily's reminder that Jesus' prayer is for us to be one. We don't have to agree, but we acknowledge that we are all connected and bound together. Let us sing. One, two, Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with 
with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together in love. The Strathdees said it really well, I think, in our one of our opening gathering songs. The spirit in me greets the spirit in you. We are all part of God's children, God's family, God's body. And what we do each and every day is meant to help us live into who God has called us to be. Your spirit is beautiful. My spirit is beautiful because it comes from God. Let us go into the world teaching about that love, teaching about what we can do to make a difference. Go in peace. As Reverend Emily mentioned in her sermon, we celebrated the ascension of Jesus this week. And our scripture reading from Acts for the day, which we didn't hear, talks about the story of Paul and Silas and uh, casting out a demon from a slave girl. So we're going to sing about that, Rise Up. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Rise up, rise up, and lift up Jesus. Rise up, rise up, and lift up the Lord. Oh, rise up, rise up, and lift up Jesus. Rise up, and lift up the Lord. I said, oh, rise up, rise up, and lift up Jesus. Rise up, rise up, and lift up the Lord. Oh, rise up, rise up, and lift up Jesus. Rise up, and lift up the Lord. Paul and Silas in a pagan town were preaching the truth to everyone they found. But when they cast a demon from a psychic slave, they were beaten and shackled in a prison cave. But around midnight in that awful place, they raised their voice in a song of praise. And as they sang, God broke their chains. He opened the door and he set them free. So rise up, rise up. And lift up Jesus, rise up, rise up, and lift up the Lord, oh, rise up, rise up, and lift up Jesus, rise up, and lift up the Lord. Jehoshaphat was in an awful mess. He cried out to God in his great distress. He said, we've got our enemies on every side. God said, don't be afraid, because the battle is mine. So they bowed and worshiped, and they stood up and praised. And they sent the singers out to lead the way. And as they praised God's holy name, God won that war and gave them victory. So rise up, rise up, and lift up Jesus, rise up, rise up, and lift up the Lord, oh, rise up, rise up, and lift up Jesus, rise up, and lift up the Lord. Give thanks unto the Lord. For his love endures forever. Give thanks unto the Lord, for his mercy never ends. 
Give thanks unto the Lord, for his love endures forever. Give thanks unto the Lord, for his mercy never ends. Oh, rise up, oh, rise up, oh, rise up, oh, rise up, rise up. And lift up Jesus, rise up, rise up. And lift up the Lord, oh, rise up, rise up. And lift up Jesus, rise up and lift up the Lord. I said, Arise up, rise up. And lift up Jesus, rise up. Oh, and lift up the Lord, oh, rise up, rise up. And lift up Jesus, rise up and lift up the Lord. Amen. Amen.